For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Many of you have probably heard that expression before, but like me, did not really realize how much it truly expresses. We're going to find out. And at the same time, this is going to be a preparatory video for the video series Peculiar Brothers. More importantly, what we're going to begin to talk about with Jesus' parables, or at least his multiple parables concerning the singular eye as either being full of light or total darkness. I don't want to leave anything to chance. Certainly not the chance of any of you misunderstanding what that very serious revelation is all about. Jesus Christ has gone into an incredible amount of depth in these parables to provide anyone who was able to receive and who did seek the guarantee that they would find. And in those parables is the truth. We're going to see that. We're going to see that. Now, I consider this an advanced video here. But don't let that put you off. You will still be able to follow it if you're new. But if you do have the chance or the time, you should review a series I did entitled Revelation 12 and Egyptian Mysticism. Uh, it's going to really bring it into perspective. For everyone else, you should already be familiar with what we've talked about. And we see the two shin rings here that connect us perfectly between these two symbolisms, one being in an ancient Egyptian, the other being in an ancient Babylonian. Well, they're both telling you the same thing. They both have the same agenda. They both have the same connected histories, descendancies, genealogies, and the same prophecy. But what I did not realize is that we see the same thing right here. Now that's the Iraqi dinar. The Iraqi dinar has got their whole entire agenda laid out perfectly for you. The Iraqi dinar is a perfect reflection of many verses in the Hebrew Bible, especially Isaiah chapter 34, as is this picture here, a perfect fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 34 and even Ezekiel chapter 19 describing Israel's mother. This is Israel's mother per the Hebrew Bible, at least as it concerns the vision of Ezekiel. Now, how does this relate with the shin ring to this picture here? We know that the shin ring represents this immortality, this symbolism for immortality, the symbolism for the immortality of man, even the symbolism for the immortality of the fallen prince as he fulfills himself as a man. And there's much more to that. This even relates back to the carbon atom. We don't have time to go into that right now. But in short, it's all about temptation. And we're going to see here that on the Palmar B. Stella, that not only is a scepter being offered from these ancient gods to the kings of the earth, one being representative by this Hammurabi king of Babylon here, um, but at the same time, the shin ring is also being offered. And it rightly should. Because right here above this event, what do we see? We see the owl of Ishtar. We see Ishtar's symbolism here of the rosette. And of course, we see our good old unicorns, which unify everything concerning the owl, the unicorns, and the bulls in Isaiah chapter 34. Now we see 
that the shin ring is going to be fractal complete. Here's how it works. I've got the uh, Holman Bible Dictionary. It's a powerful study tool and I recommend it to anybody that is serious about this research. I've, I've basically just looked up Hammurabi but because there is so much here and it's a whole entire video in itself to show you all of the fractal connections here. That number 44, Rabbi, the stone was a relief of Hamar Rabbi Rabbi with 44 columns. 44 columns. That's just so connected, is it not? It's connected to 44 presidents of the United States. It's connected to Israel being separated at its 44th king. It's, separate, it's being connected to divide and conquer. It's connected to everything. But we don't have time to go ahead and go into the details there, but we do have time to go into the details here. So at this portion it says, the relief of Hammurabi shows him receiving a scepter and a ring from Shemesh. We know that Shemesh is an overlay of symbolisms for the sun god. And of course we know, we see the same overlay of the symbolisms for the sun god here, just in its Egyptian description. The relief of Hammurabi shows him receiving a scepter and a ring. Now, Hammurabi is this figure here, and he would be considered an elite. He would be considered a king of the earth. The relief of Hammurabi shows him receiving a scepter and a ring from Shemesh, the divine lawgiver. The scepter and ring are symbols of justice and order. More importantly, a new world order. Right? A new sueptus novus ordo seclorum. The Stella begins by describing the king's divine call to make justice to shine forth in the land, to destroy the evil and the wicked, that the strong might not oppress the weak, to give light to the land. Now, of course, we're talking about Israel going to the land of Shinar. We know that Shinar is where this supposed justice is coming from. In other words, their form of justice, this stone known as the millstone. Because remember, their justice was throwing stones, accusing peoples to death, and that stones would be thrown at them to bring them to their death. Well, from micro to macro, it's the very same thing with the millstone. So this justice that is shining forth is shining forth from the land of Shinar, a.k.a. the moon, representation of this destruction, a.k.a. the destroyer, Apollyon, that particular evil and wicked himself. But of course he has indoctrinated these men of the earth to believe that it's someone else. All right? So you could actually Google... Shin Ring and the Hammurabi Stella to see that this is actually the most famous description in ancient times of the Shin Ring itself. It's the most well-known place where we can find the symbolism for the Shin Ring. It's not here, as we've already looked at, and it's not really here that the most famous place to see this understanding is really here. Now we only see the scepter being offered, but as you know that the history records the scepter and the ring. Now why is that so important? Well because the 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 ring is symbolism of this uh, immortality which is connected to this doctrine of ye are gods which is the temptation that the serpent offers uh, the daughters of men in Genesis. And as we see, certain portions of them have taken it. The serpent says that with his particular knowledge, as he's tempting, he says that with it, you can be as gods.
God had seen the daughters of men as sacred to their undertaking because the women have the particular chromosome advantage that they're looking for because the female gives up two-thirds more genetic material to the offspring than the male. That's what makes our women sacred to their agenda to produce these progeny of men which become the elites from this descendancy in modern times they are known as the illuminati which is associated with this shining justice but we're going to see that this justice is iniquitous and we're going to see that in great detail so all of that is perfectly connected with what we saw in rev 12 with this supposed false Israel that believes itself to be the remnant that's going to inherit the earth and be made these gods for fulfilling this particular level of great work. And I just thought that you guys should understand that it is right there and it's all connected. All right, so you should basically understand the foundation of all that information, as I said, if you have reviewed Revelation 12 and Egyptian mysticism. Right. Now, let's begin. I just realized that uh, I did not stop talking during that volume outage. And the next time the volume outage is going to come up is at the 22nd, the 20 minute, 20 second marker. And I'm going to try to remember to stop speaking at that point okay now let's go ahead and review the entirety of Ephesians chapter 6 or not the entirety here you should go over that on your own I'm gonna go ahead and start reading here at verse 10 the warriors power finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that ye, may be, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, key word there, against powers, against the rulers, kings of the earth, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about you with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god amen the absolute truth understand that absolutely Whew. above all above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And where are these fiery darts of the wicked coming from? Where's this shining justice coming from? Well, it's coming from Shinar, right? And we know that they are to disguise their attack as meteors or asteroids. In other words, this fire from the sky, Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 incredible and we're going to see how all this fulfills and we're going to see that the writer at least of this portions of Ephesians knows exactly who's bringing it and exactly where it's coming from it's coming from these wicked ones in these high places now you're going to see how that relates exactly with what you're looking at here in other words these birds of heaven that occupy these high places of the Avon. All right, that's, that's what the key is here. The key is to connect wickedness, this meaning of the wicked to this high place. And the key to the fractal understanding 
is the birds of heaven that occupy it. And then this descriptive term of birds known as avian. And let's go ahead and take a look. Now we've looked at this somewhat before, but you haven't seen it as it connects in this light. Avon. Now, Avon, avian birds. Hebrew noun meaning wickedness. Used in place names to indicate Israel's understanding of the place, place as site of idol worship. Used in place names to indicate Israel's understanding of the place as site of idol worship. Well, their chief place of the site of idol worship is going to be the moon, as is described in Revelation chapter 12, where they are going to be fed in this special place by their Lord. That's this place of idol worship. It is that high place of this spiritual wickedness of the high places this high place of Avon, it's going to be the moon. It says, referred to major worship centers of Israel, referred to An or Heliopolis in Egypt, referred to major worship centers of Israel, such as Beth El and Dan, referred to a valley, very important, retain that, referred to, to a valley, perhaps one in a place of popularly known names such as Beth Avon for Beth El. All right, Avon. Avon meaning wickedness. And you can begin to understand what the writer is telling you here. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now remember, Mystery Babylon is ecclesiastical Babylon, spiritual Babylon, spiritual wickedness in high places. Is this not a bird of heaven? Does not Isaiah chapter 34, which is the full fulfillment of the Iraqi dinar and this picture here, describing these very birds of heaven that are coming down from this place after this blood sacrifice. And the unicorns and the bulls and the bullocks shall come down with them. Where are they coming down from? They're coming down from Shinar, this place of high spiritual wickedness. Now, that should have really explained itself because it's going to be important to see these relationships to on and as you know ephraim's mother the 13th tribe of israel and even manasseh the 14th tribe of israel are born from the daughter of the high priest asneth from the temple of on which is also known as heliopolis which is the temple of the sun. And there we see Shemesh, Utu Shemesh, Marduk, Inki, which is being representative of this sun. The very same thing that we see being depicted right here in singular eye form, of which you're gonna see this singular eye form is full of darkness by the obstruction of light of which you see that it is obstructing the light right in front of you. It is between you and the light obstructing its view, obstructing your view of what that light really is. That's their plan. So we got to be able to see this connection with false Israel, which is being led by uh, northern, by the chief of northern Israel known as Ephraim. Ephraim is considered the stone of Israel, and then Ephraim is also considered the shepherd of Israel. And that's going to be very important if you want to understand that single eye parable of Jesus Christ to realize that Ephraim is considered the shepherd of Israel. And we're going to get to that very shortly.
Okay. Now, all of this other stuff you should know, Ephraim is born from this Egyptian descendancy. And then we see that it's also connected to Dan. Incredible. Incredible. Not only is it connected to our birds of heaven with the very name Avon, but it's also connected to the place of this wickedness, which is going to connect us back to Shinar. And you're going to see that it's going to connect to everything else. All right. Now, we should definitely get you to pay attention to this and what it's really telling you. It's talking about this fiery darts. Who is sending these fiery darts on this evil day? Well, it's these wicked ones from this high place, which from Zechariah 5 is the land of Shinar, the moon, which is where the remnant is taken to in Rev 12. Cut and dry. Absolutely cut and dry. Plain and simple. Okay, now the next thing that we need to do is let's go ahead and take a look at Hosea chapter 10. And this is going to bring so much stuff together, guys. So much stuff here. I'm going to go ahead and read the entirety of chapter 10. But before I do, I'd like you to ponder this verse starting here at verse 5. What will ye do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? Now remember, that's that great supper that we see in Revelation 12 that those birds of heaven are called down to. It says, for lo, they are gone because of destruction. Who's gone? Well, that would be false Israel. Where did I tell you that they are going to? They are leaving here and they are going to the land of Shinar because of what? Because of the millstone, this destruction. They are this remnant that is being rescued or saved from this coming millstone. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Egypt shall gather them up. Well, who is this chief descendancy of Egypt on Hebraic terms? Well, that would be Ephraim. And then Ephraim is the one, the chief ones of Ephraim, that has been preparing this place of Shinar, the moon, for this remnant for a very long time. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Now that's going to time up with Zechariah 11:17 as it describes, Woe unto the idle shepherd, the sword shall be upon his arm, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Once again, that single eye, full of darkness. And he shall leaveth the flock. It's going to describe Ephraim, the false shepherd, the shepherd of Israel, leaving the flock, it's the very same thing that it's describing here. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. And that is going to be the chief ones of Ephraim shall gather them up. Now we know that that is in description of the separation of the wheat and the tares. The wheat believe they're going to be gathered and they're going to be taken to this field of dreams, which is relative to the movie in which Kevin Costner appeared by the very same title, which is all about build it and they will come. What are they building? Well, they are building a base in the land of Shinar. And the field of dreams is this field of corn. The corn in biblical terms translates as wheat. This wheat remnant, which is really the blackness of the ergot, of the ephah, is being taken to the moon. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. Wow. False Israel does not realize that this new capital of Memphis, which is going to be relative to the Hebraic understanding of their new Zion, is actually going to be a place where many of them are going to be buried. It says the pleasant places for their silver nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. 
think about this pleasant place as you see here in chapter 13 of verse 9 of the book of Hosea. Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Now, as we said, that has multiple meanings. Ephraim is the 13th tribe of Israel. Tyrus is representative of what? Tyrus is representative of these Danites. It's representative of Nergal. Nergal and Tyrus are synonymous. And I don't know if I have time to show you that. I think I already have. Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place. Now, this is going to be relative to these two furrows, which is what we should see is going to be connected back here with Avon, unbelievably, referred to a valley. This valley is going to be this furrow or one of these furrows that we're going to see come up basically right, uh, right on over here in verse 10. It is in my desire that I should chastise them and the people should be gathered against them when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. Who's going to bind themselves in their two furrows? Well, this false nation witnesses that are being led by the Ephraimite fallen tribe of Israel, they are going to bind themselves in their two valleys, their two furrows. One of them will be the land of Shinar. The other will be their cities underneath the earth. That is their two furrows. That is their two pasture land. Ephraim literally means two pasture land. Now I'm going to try to remember that we're going to have a pause in the time here coming at the 30 minute marker starting at 20 seconds of so 30 minutes. So in order not to jump around so much here, guys, let us... Uh, just cause you to kind of recap here for lo they are gone who's gone well the idle shepherds are gone they've gone to the land of Shinar because of this destruction where have they built their altars because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin sin is who the Babylonian moon god altars shall be unto him to sin for Israel hath forgotten his maker and buildeth temples these temples will be relative to palaces, which will be relative to this temple palace of Zion, of which is going to be connected to this shining place, which is going to be Shinar. And Judah hath multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. This vision of the depiction of of this destruction that happens to them by fire is going to be increasingly fulfilled in your own understanding if you pay close attention. Now, let us just reflect here from verse 13. No accident. Ephraim's the 13th tribe. We see that they are planted in the pleasant place. If you remember my drawing, that pleasant place is going to be Shinar, the moon. And they're going to bring forth their children to the murderer. Well, their children being brought forth to the murderer is double in meaning. It means they're going to bring the children of their nations, the undesirables that they have deemed in their nations to the murderer, which is in connection to the millstone, which is in reflection of that great falling star, Lucifer that was cast down to the ground before the feet of kings. But it's also going to be relative to the remnant, their royal children, that they're actually bringing to the murderer this land of Shinar. It fulfills in every way imaginable. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying moom, womb and dry breasts. Now it's all about a woman in travail. It's all about childbirth, is it not? All their wickedness is in Gilgal. Our revolters 
Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit, yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. Now, who's actually being slain here? The beloved fruit of their womb is that calf of Samaria. It's going to be the prince in material form. That is the portion of this descendancy of Ephraim because he fulfills himself through that genetic descendancy, through the sacred feminine, through this Elite race of which you know they're obsessed with genetics, the caduceus, the double rising serpent upon that rod, that rod of iron, which is the symbolism for serpent wisdom, which is the symbolism for Inki, the god of this world. So... You should understand that not all of the ancient seers fully realize the love and mercy of the spirit of truth. They do their best to convey to you what this truth is, but I'm going to do my best to give you the modern, progressive fullness of this understanding, just as Jesus Christ described that when the spirit of truth come, he will reveal to you the things that the ancient apostles and prophets could not yet bear. Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit, yea, they, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away, because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. All right, let's go ahead and speed this up here. And I guess I, uh, I forgot to not talk at that 30 minute marker. Sorry about that. Response of Jehovah continued. Chapter 10. I just got to go ahead and read this here. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. From now they shall say, We have no king, because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely, and making a covenant. This covenant of supposed love. They have spoken words, swearing falsely, and making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as a hemlock in the furrows of the fields. The furrows of the fields, those valleys that are associated with the high places of Avon, and then even the secondary place that is connected to their two pasture land, which would be these cities in the inner earth. It says, referred to a valley. Now a valley is a furrow. Now a furrow has something to do with plowing, which has everything to do with what I told you the symbolism is in the movie, The Field of Dreams. You plow fields. Well, it's just so happened here, we have on the back of the Iraqi dinar, we have this sick, this sickle symbolism for the symbolism of the reaping. We see the gathering here of the wheat, and then we see the plowing of the furrows. It's all there. They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as a hemlock in the furrows of the field. Now, which judgment is going to springeth up as a hemlock in the furrows of the field of dreams, this land of Shinar? Well, Dan is. Dan is going to be this great hemlock tree, which is going to be the judgment that Jacob describes shall judge his people. And this is going to be interesting how this all turns out. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Bethaven. Who are the calves of Bethaven? Well, that would be this descendancy, the Nephilim, this descendancy of the sons of God, otherwise known as the army of Joel II. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Bethaven. For the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it, for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. Now, the supposed glory that they believe these ancient mighty ones had that have been bound under the earth really is not going to be glorious. It is going to be a wicked thing that they inadvertently or that they have planned to bring upon the world for their benefit, but now has really 
going to bring about their judgment and destruction in more ways than one. It shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame. Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. That is Enki. The high places also of Avon. The high places also of Avon. The sin of Israel. What's the sin of Israel? It's Shinar. It's the place where they're bringing this stone, the millstone, as Jesus Christ said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Well, they're obviously not without sin if they are casting this stone from the very foundation of the Babylonian moon sin itself. Jesus Christ's words are going to reach you. The high places also of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The Shinar place, their supposed refuge, is going to be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills fall on us. Wow. You know, or you might not know, or even false Israel, these secret societies, these fraternal orders, might not realize that what we see in Revelation is really talking about them. Let's take a look at it. Sing to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us. Have you heard that before? Yeah, you have. You've heard it in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. Let's go ahead and listen close as it describes from verse 15 forward. And the kings of the earth. Kings of the earth? What are we talking about here? Are we not talking about a descendancy of these kings of the earth that have been chosen? and have been tempted with the supposed immortality to commit this great work and promise this great refuge if they would just commit this horrible, heinous act, that they would be protected and then given some sort of reward? The very kings of the earth, the Elites, the Illuminati, the Illuminated, the Shining Ones? Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're talking about that. That's exactly right. Well, that's exactly what this portion of Revelation is talking about. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, the great men and the rich men, are these not the elites, the remnant that are being taken to this land of Shinar, the supposed privileged ones? Remember, Jesus is for the poor and needy. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. This place that they're hiding themselves is going to be twofold. One of them will be the rocks and the mountains and the dens of Shinar. And then the other will be the rocks and the dens of the earth itself where Ephraim shall bind itself in those two furrows, as you see being shown to you right here. And said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Well, not them. But what we see here once again is another misportrayal of the mercy and the love that Jesus Christ is truly gonna bring. Because if you've understand everything that I've taught and the other scriptures that are provided, we see that Israel itself is bringing about its own sin. It describes that they shall die in their sin, that my people shall be destroyed, not by God, but by lack of knowledge. And said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Well, certainly not these ones that are throwing stones from these wicked high places of Shinar, a.k.a. Avon. Review verse 7, 8. Cover us. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Who's saying that? It's this descendancy. It's this royal elite. These chief captains. These chief kings of the earth. This special, privileged, supposed elite few. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them.
Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught. Now remember, who were the heifers that were taught? And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pause again for the volume outage. It's hard for me to keep up with everything I'm trying to tell you. I apologize for anything that you're missing. <sighs> okay. It says, an Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught. Who were the heifers? Remember the cows were the daughters of men that were chosen. Okay, and they were taught because that's what the book of Enoch says. It says that these fallen angels, these fallen messengers of God, a.k.a. the sons of God, took unto themselves all the daughters of which they chose. And then it describes them teaching sorceries unto them. Ephraim is as an heifer that was taught. Ephraim is as a daughter of man that was taught from Genesis 6 and loveth to tread out the corn. Well, what's treading out the corn? Well, that's bringing about this judgment which is the supposed destruction, in other words, separation of the wheat and the tares, that we see is in relation not to God gathering them up, but the symbolism of Egypt, which, in, which is in direct symbolism for the Ephraimite Egyptian descendancy, the chief of their descendancy, which is gathering that remnant up, which is exactly what you see being depicted to you right here from Nekbet and Wajet with the shin rings. Amazing, amazing. So, and Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn, but I passed up, but I passed over upon her fair neck. Remember they chose unto themselves all the daughters of men of which they thought were fair. I will make Ephraim to ride, Judah shall plow and Jacob shall break his clods. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you, not fire upon you. It says, verse 13, ye have plowed wickedness. Remember the two furrows, the plowing. What do we see on the, on the back of the Iraqi Dina? Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies. Verse 13, the fruit of lies, what is the fruit of lies? Well, that's the ye are God's deception that the serpent offers as a symbolic fruit from the Garden of Eden event. Because thou distrust in thy way and the multitude of thy mighty men. Who is the multitude of thy mighty men? Well, it's going to be the figurative description of the Danites, a.k.a. these mighty men, which we see Samson, a.k.a. figurative Gilgamesh, uh, is connected to this Hercules-type figure. Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses, Zion means fortress, this Zion, this fortress of the moon, shall be spoiled as Shalman spoiled Beth Arabel and the day of battle. The mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. Now we know that this mother, AKA the occultic version of Mystery Babylon, is going to be destroyed. Their philosophy will be wiped away from the face of the earth. So shall Beth El. Now that's going to be in connection with these bulls, which is going to be in connected to these ancient mighty ones, which is going to be in connected to Dan, which is going to be this army of Joel too, which is going to actually backfire on the very ones who are seeking to release them. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. I keep on missing that time thing. So shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be, utterly be cut off. Oh boy, what is this called? This is called their great dawning, all right? Their uh, dawning of this new world order, the order of the golden dawn. This morning time, right? Well, we see that their great king this Apollyon, this Inky, is going to be cut off in the very morning that he is birthed out. Amazing. Absolutely amazing.
and there is so much more to show you guys and we're gonna do it and you wait till you see how the words of jesus christ is going to time up to all this you know chapter eight basically the chapter right before what we were just reading said the trumpet to thy mouth he shall come as an eagle against the house of the lord well we know the united states the the chief royalty of the united states is symbolized with this eagle we know that the nazis are symbolized with the eagle we know that rome is symbolized with the eagle we know that these fair-skinned complected ones have always chosen this eagle as their symbolism and then we know that the eagle in hebraic terms is reflective of the vulture all relating back to ancient Egypt, and it's no mystery because that's exactly where the Ephraimites get it from. Wow. Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be, be ere they attain to innocency? For from Israel was it also the workmen made it. Now, what are they called? They're called these master masons, these laborers, these workers. It's called the great work. For from Israel was it also the workmen made it. Therefore, it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. For they have sown the wind. What does it describe in Zechariah 5? It describes them being the two ladies bearing them up on this wings of the wind. For they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. They're going to reap this whirlwind in the land of Shinar. It says, it hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. Wow. Who are the strangers? The strangers are the army of Joel 2. It seems that this army of Joel 2, who they think is going to be so very unfriendly to us, is actually going to be no respecter of persons either. And it's going to be very unfriendly to them also because they are seeking dominion, dominion from all of mankind, false Israel included. Because remember, false Israel has been duped. They've been tempted. They have been deceived and they're blind and they don't see it. But the seer sees it. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure for, their, for they have gone up to Assyria a wild ass alone by himself Ephraim hath hired lovers wow we're going to see how Ephraim hath hired lovers is going to really connect into some big stuff because it says here in the very next line yea though they have hired among the nations now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. Now, who's the king of princes? Well, that would be Inki, the prince or the fallen prince of this world. And now we see it's all connected back to the altars of Sun, Sin, a.k.a. this moon location. The chief thing to see here is how it's going to connect with the parable understanding of Jesus' words, talking about these hirelings as it's going to be related to these strangers and we need to go to John 10 to see it. Here comes a quick train. You should remember this from the video series, Ye Are Gods, and Jesus Christ's parable, go and let you know the truth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Jesus can lead you out. You call upon his name. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow but will flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. These strangers, it's the army of Joel too. 
It's easy. I did remember to pause there. And the stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now this is the parable fulfillment of the army of Joel 2, and we've already proved it. It says, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things there they were which he spake unto them. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them, not the true sheep. I am the door by me. Now the, the sheep in wolves' clothing, they hearken to these strangers, but not the true sheep. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Awesome. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep are not seeth the wolf. Who's the wolf? Dan is the wolf. But he that is a hireling, who is the hireling? Well, Ephraim is the hireling and Ephraim has even further hired more. And we know that is in relationship to what we see with Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber, and all of these supposed mega American idol superstars and idol superstars from the false nations of this world that have been hired to flash this one-eyed, darkened, right eye symbolism of the idol shepherd who shall leave the flock. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. Where are they leaving the sheep to? Well, we know where they're leaving. They're going to the land of Shinar, Revelation 12, Zechariah 5, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. But it says, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Now, Jesus Christ is describing the army of Joel 2 in great detail, great detail. And he is also describing the understanding of the Ephraimite shepherd as Jacob describes some from Genesis chapter 48 and 49. So Jesus is telling you that he is the good shepherd that's not going to leave the sheep that has already given his life for the sheep, but the false shepherd who has hired the other idle shepherds is planning on leaving the sheep right before these wolves come. In other words, the army of Joel 2, a.k.a. the locust of Revelation chapter 9, 11. They are going to leave the, sh the flock, which fulfills what we see in Zechariah 11:17 that describes the idle shepherd who has his right eye utterly darkened shall leave the flock and there is our chief false shepherd that has his right eye utterly darkened and his left eye exposed which is still further symbolism for darkness as you're going to see he's obstructing the light he is the obstruction of light which now casts the shadow and not the light itself. As you see, this triangle eye is blocking what light there is, but it is relationship to the sun. Even deeper meaning of the true sun, who this being is trying to masquerade himself as, but in reality, he's just the obstruction of light. The only thing that he could cast is the absence of light, which is the projection of the shadow. And the only thing that he can offer in its place is this glare of light, of the angle of light that is hitting off of the misconstrued material concepts of his material doctrine, which now produces the blinding glare of his obstruction of light that is now casting off of his faulty material concepts, his doctrines of men, the doctrines 
of manly men, manly pee hall. It's all there, friends. It's all there. So, as verse 13 in relationship to Hosea 9.13 and even 13.13, 13, Zechariah 11.17, verse 13, Jesus going to tell you, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. No, nope, they don't care about you at all. Jesus says, I am a good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. Yes, I know Jesus Christ. And the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That's an important verse there. We're going to have to come back to that fulfillment of meaning. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command, this commandment have I received of my Father. Wow. So if we want to understand further what this parable is of chapter 10 of the book of John, you need to look to the army of Joel 2 and the book of chapter 2 of Joel. But to get a further meaning of what this really means, we're going to focus on these wolves that are connecting, connecting to this scattering. And we have to go once again to the words of Jesus Christ. Now, I've kind of brought us to the parable understanding a little earlier with Jesus than I thought that I was going to. But it is so very important. It's so very important. This is going to be chapter 11 of the book of Luke and let's just quickly just read verse 23 to keep your attention he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth who's the ones that are scattering and are not sent to gather it's those wolves in other words the army of Joel too now why are they wolves in configuration of also serpents scorpions uh asses, donkeys, birds of heaven, bulls, unicorns, all of these other configurations. Well, you would have to realize where these fallen ones descended upon as per the understanding of the book of Enoch. That would be Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is famous for its wolves. And the famous wolves of Mount Hermon are these ones that have been hermetically sealed, which is connected to nature's very own hermetic seal which would be the egg. And this egg doesn't have anything good in it. It's got cockatrices, serpents, scorpions, evil eyes that these people are being tricked into producing by their absolute lack of spiritual integrity, morality. They have become spiritually retarded and they have no idea what good is any longer. So Jesus in this parable is going to reveal who he's talking about and you're going to see something unique. Remember what I told you about Dan as it describes in Genesis chapter 48, 49 as being the one that shall judge his people who they think are sending to judge us in which they're going to attempt to judge us. They're going to attempt to bring evil against us also. But we see all those that are sealed with the spirit of truth as it describes in Revelation chapter 9 in their foreheads. They can't be hurt. But we see these ones that are not sealed by the spirit of truth. They can be hurt. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Is not Ephraim's kingdom being divided between these two furrows, these two pasture lands? Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided. Who is the house we're talking about? We're talking about the house of Israel. And a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub, and... If I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, shall they be your judges? Wow. Jesus Christ is saying that if you don't see me as the merciful, 
all loving one and you were so blind that you were trying to cast out devils in the name of these very devils themselves well since you praise and worship these devils and cast out the supposed Shall they be your judges? Who are the judges that we see Jacob has prophesied shall judge false Israel? Well, that would be these ancient mighty ones, these wolves, these Danites. But if I, but if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Who's the strong man that Jesus is going to talk about right here? It's not talking about the army of Joel 2. It's talking about Israel, these kings of the world, these mighty chieftains of the world that are in possession of now the world's resources. They consider themselves the strong and they are armed, are they not? Yes, they are because they have this military might. They have this military technology. They have this technology which is gonna bring this armament upon us, which is associated with a millstone, which is now associated with these fiery darts, which are associated with these supposed rockets, which are supposed to be faked as asteroids and millstones that come from their high place of Avon, Shinar the moon. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Talking about Ephraim, they got their palace, their temple based on Shinar, but it says, but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusteth and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. It is these stronger which is the army of Joel too, which are not going to regard Israel, false Israel, as anything special. They're going to regard them as pawns that have been used to bring these beings in to take over this dominion. And we see that Ephraim, the nations of the world, the kings of the world, these secret societies, these fraternal orders, these ones that are blinded to the morality of truth and goodness, do unto your neighbor as you would have done unto you. They are most certainly not fulfilling that command. And we see that it's going to backfire upon them, that they are going to be destroyed by their own lack of knowledge, by the very lack of knowledge of these beings that they plan to release, that they think are glorious and good, are actually not. That they are foul and decrepit, and they have an agenda of their own. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. We saw who those were that scattereth, and we saw very well who they were. And it is these wolves that we see in relationship to the hireling, the false shepherds have brought about, and that they plan on leaving before their arrival. Well, guess what? These wolves are going to make it up to their refuge, to their land of Shinar, and they're going to spoil their tabernacle. They're going to spoil their temple. They're going to spoil their food stores. And these people have no idea unless they take people like us seriously and they realize that what we can deliver through the spirit of truth is absolutely very serious as well. So if we want to understand about these false shepherds leaving the flock, hopefully I have enough time in this video series to go over it. Let me bring us right quickly, and I pray that you retain what I just showed you. Let us uh, make sense of what we see here in Zechariah. We see that this woman, it says, Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. Goeth forth, they're leaving. And I said, What is it? And he said, this is an ephath that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talon of lead. And this is a woman. This is that Ishtar that we see in Rev 12 that sitteth in the midst of the ephath. Now, the ephath is a measure of dry grain, which represents wheat, which also represents 
blackness and darkness, which will fulfill the symbol of who this single eye really is. It's not full of light like it wants to project itself. It's only casting the shadow and doesn't realize it. And he said, this is wickedness. Did we not start out with the understanding of this wickedness in high places? And behold, there was lifted up, lifted up high place. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah. And he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted up mine eyes and looked. And behold, there came out two women. And the wind was in their wings. Remember, they sowed the whirlwind. For they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. Between the earth and heaven. That's the moon, my friend. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said to me, To build it in the house of the land of Shinar. Remember that shining justice and judgment that's going to bring upon what? Their version of justice is throwing stones at sinners when in fact they're on the very foundation of sin themselves. And he said unto me, build it in the house of the land of Shinar and it shall be established. Jashin means he establishes. Jashin is one of the two columns of the Temple of Solomon. Jashin represents this remnant of Israel which was established to bring about the genetic descendancy for the potential of the fallen prince to fulfill himself in material form. In other words, these great workers. To build it in the house in the land of Shinar, the moon, and it shall be established and set there upon her own moon base. Revelation 12. Now, so much more there. Are we not dealing with... We're talking about this ephath as being a measure or a cup, and then we're going to see stands for something which has come to the full. In other words, the second cup. It's come to the full. This birthing moment has come to the full. So that God must judge it, okay? A woman in the bad ethical sense. We know that that woman in the bad ethical sense is Ishtar, and it just keeps on going. The Babylonian phase of the apostate church is symbolized by an unchastised woman. In other words, that whore siding with the greed and luxury of commercialism. That's going to be Ishtar, the remnant that's bringing its luxuries to the moon, its resources as it seeks to starve us out. In reality, it's going to be they themselves that starve themselves out by their very own lack of knowledge. Now, I have got a lot more to show you, believe it or not. I didn't even touch base on half of the things that I want to show you. But I'm going to go ahead and close this video out here. And let us go ahead and view at least how the beginning of Zechariah chapter 11 begins, where we're going to find this understanding of the idle shepherd. Just listen closely. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. How, fir tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. How? We got a lot of howlers on this channel. Rufus Howler, Jakari73, aka Matt Nicholson, and their whole gang are just lollygagging and reveling and joking in their little game. But guess what? The joke is upon them. O ye oaks of Bashin, for the forest of the vintage is come down. Wow. Remember that Dan shall leap forth from the land of Bashin, right? From the land of giants. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds for their glory is spoiled. A voice of the roaring. So these shepherds are like wolves themselves, is it not? And their glory that they think they're going to receive this supposed crown is spoiled. Do you hear that crown sevenfold? Are you going to be able to provide this spiritual help to these people? That you think that I'm only going to be able to provide physical help? <laughs> My friend, I'm providing the spiritual help to you. Get out while you can. You're blind, friend. You're blind. Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. Remember in Revelation 12 that they're being fed in this land of Shinar? They most certainly are. They most certainly are. Now let's go ahead and jump forward to verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. What did Jesus Christ describe in John 10 and Luke chapter 11? Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm. What is the sword? The sword is, rep is in representation of this judgment that they bring. The idle shepherd is going to one that's going to have this sword of judgment, which is the millstone. And upon his right eye. 
his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now you see what the parable of the singular eye is revealing, and who thinks they have the light eye, but in reality, they got the dark eye. It is the idle shepherd. It is the fullness of the idle shepherds, Ephraim himself, and then his hirelings that he has hired out that we see with these rock stars and these elite, these movie stars. And whose eye is utterly darkened? Well, it's these false shepherds. It most certainly is. It most certainly is. So if you can remember just a few things that you have seen there, let us remember what we see here in the book of Hosea, chapter 9, verse 6. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Who's gone? These idle shepherds, where are they going? Egypt shall gather them up to Shinar. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places for their silver, nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacle. What is that pleasant place that they prepared? It's Shinar. It's the moon. Remember, shall establish it a base in the land of Shinar. Memphis shall bury them.